Geeks, this is Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Geeks, who's coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan, Rockefeller Center, New York City, on Newsstand Studios, joined as usual with Nastasia the Hammer Lopez. How are you doing, Stas? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. I'm a little disappointed you're not wearing a trucker's hat. I thought you maybe. I, I don't know why. I felt as I was biking here today, you'd be wearing a trucker's hat. Do I usually? I know, but like, I don't know. I just Once felt, in a blue moon. I just felt... <laughs> Trucker hat. Okay. It's because yeah. I posted that photo. This yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. We got uh, John here with us, too. How you doing, John? Doing great, thanks. You chefing it up? Chefing it up strong? You know it. Love it. I'm loving it. Rocking panels here. We got Joe Hazen. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Yeah? How you doing? Doing well. We have now... I'm told that a lot of uh, back and forth with the internet, you know, you've spoken to the magic gnomes who send the ones and zeros over the tubes, and that Quinn, you're not going to drop out today from, uh, from your... your uh, post in vancouver island is that true yeah that that is the goal yeah yeah so yeah. far so good and certainly not least uh a man who's making a health smoothie smoothie as we speak <laughs> whatever in the whatever in the heck a health smoothie is we got uh, jackie molecules in california how you doing hello i'm doing great yeah and uh you know this what we're, what we're going to do from now on until someone tells us we shouldn't is we're going to introduce the guest that's in the studio right away so they can, you know, join us while we're shooting the breeze. So today's special guest, first time on the show, welcome to Raja Morel. How you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, you are the, so, <laughs> contributor, what do you put, what do you call yourself on, on, on the new book? Author? Co-author. Co Co-author of the new yeah. book, Saver, memoir of uh, Fatima Ali, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But, uh, you know, I got to address the fact that every time when we came here, Nastasi was like, that was Taraja's old family wine shop across the hall. <laughs> Hmm? And she does talk like that when she's not on the air, by the way, if you've ever met her. It's true. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're across the, the way here from your family's old, like, hyper fancy wine shop. What's that like? Did you, so this is relatively new, right? Like 2000 or 1999 or something like that? That's exactly right. I think it was at 2001. Maybe this, this the wine shop was 2000. And then the restaurant, which used to be adjacent, was 2001. So when you were a kid, were you playing around in the old store? Like, you know, like, yeah? Yes. What's I did less playing around in this shop. In this one? Yeah, right. I was sort of a grown-up. It also doesn't look very play-friendly. Not play-friendly. Not play-friendly. No. Yeah. So for those of you that haven't, like, uh, f first of all, for those of you that aren't, like, my age and, uh, and you know, older like New York kind of wine scene way back in the day, there were a couple of high end wine shops mm -hmm. in in New York, mm -hmm. right? And like the two, I went to cut rate wine shops. Yeah, I went to Garnett. You know what I mean? Or like you know places like that. But like you know, there were a couple of uh, high end wine shops, and the two that everyone talks about are yours, Morel and Sherry Lehman. Those Correct. Are two. Were you guys friends or no? Um, I mean, you know. The top competitors. So, but I think like so. No. I, well, but I think there's like a commonality and understanding when you're competing against each other and and kind of doing those those same deals at those levels and looking for those interesting wines. So, yeah. I'd yeah. say good vibes mostly. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were were they in that kind of in that public auction business because you guys were early in in that public auction stuff, right? You've really done your homework, Dave. It's my I must job. Say. Um, it's my job. Yes, uh, my father and Morell and Company were the first to begin to do wine auctions when it was made legal, which it was not for a very long time. That one of the really difficult things about ha being a, a wine retailer in New York is that there's a lot of laws left over from prohibition, if you can believe it. Things like not being able to own multiple locations. And um, so when the law changed in terms of being allowed to do wine auctions, my dad beat the pack, like including Christie's and Sotheby's and was able to hold the first one. So like... Question on, I mean, I know that's not why we're here, but question on, so when was that roughly? Do you remember? Uh, gosh, I would say 2005, right, it's late, six. It's relatively late, right? Because it used to be like, you know, because my family was in Westchester, so they would they would wait for like the professionals to do their wine auction stuff and then buy futures from like Zaki's yeah. or something like that. yeah. So you guys are also did that kind of business. We did. Too. We yeah. did. My dad was big into futures and yeah. and buying the um, Bordeaux when they were babies and letting them age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So growing up as like the sign of like uh, I guess you're the third generation or something like this. Uh, yes. Yeah. So as a third generation uh, kind of a uh, wine family, what happens when someone comes to your house and brings you something that you're like, oh Jesus. Oh, man. When they bring over are you the okay? yellow tail, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you okay with it? Like, what's your still? What, what happens um, I in the Morel household when yellow tail arrives? Thank you so much. Yeah. And then I put it under the sink with the Windex. And stuff. <laughs> 
and uh, and like I know that like you know you uh, the family sold the business sometime like 2015 or something like this, right? Or 2018 um, or something like this. Yeah, 2015. Something I think like, it yeah. was. So, but are you still allowed to kind of go over there and break something and then be like, Morel, and then walk out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's I might try that when we're done recording. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the same people still work for the company, and so they kind of. I think I'm just snooping around, and they go, "I uh, Raja." Uh, all right. <laughs> but nice. I, but no, I mean, I can't really afford anything across the way, and yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's well, gotten very high end. Well, they always put the. I mean, like, okay, another question. Since you're, you know, part of the family here, like, who who is walking into this building who looks at like I can't read it that far away, but let's say it's a two thousand dollar, you know, Magnum or something, and they're like, I'm gonna buy that. Yeah, I'm gonna buy that one. Yeah, that one. Um, I think it's like the people with the corporate cards that are buying them as uh, as gifts on expense accounts of some kind, and that's part of something they can write off. Or, you know, people who really just love to drink fancy wines, and, and then fancy um, equals expensive to them. Yeah, I, I like to drink great wine. I don't like to pay for it. I'm with you. Yeah, I'm definitely on the same page. So, if you're listening live on Patreon, call in your questions to 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. And, John, why don't you tell them how to join the Patreon if they don't know how. Patreon.com slash Cooking Issues. And uh, is, uh, is Taraj's uh, book, is the is Saver uh, on the, are we getting a discount at Kitchen Arts and Letters? Think I'll we, have to check with Matt. There we go. All right. Let's just assume that he will. Let's just assume that'll happen. Good assumption. Yeah. Are you uh, are you are you going to go up to Kitchen Arts and Letters? Are you going to do anything with them or no? I mean, it's not a cookbook. We'll get into a sec. We'll get into a sec. Cause we haven't shot the breeze yet. Has anyone had any good food experiences before we uh, of the past week? Anything? Anything at all? I have. Oh. <laughs> Am I allowed to speak? Of course. That's why we introduced <laughs> you early. Cool. Um. Yeah. So. This weekend, um, and in fact, the past two weekends, I've been going to a westerly canteen pop-up in upstate New York, and it's this incredible um, kitted out 1971 Airstream that's been turned into a mobile kitchen mm. that this chef, Molly Levine, who has great things under her belt, including working at Chez Panisse, and her partner, who is an amazing farmer, um, have created this, this mobile restaurant, and they're doing pop-ups and stuff, and their food is gorgeous. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's oh. crazy delicious and so flavorful and, and very beautifully sourced. And is the Airstream still all shiny and aluminum? It's super, super shiny. Uh, yeah. I love, I love yeah, it. Yeah, and it's also like so chic on the inside and, yeah. and minimalist and, and just gorgeous. And they run that thing off of propane or do they generator it or what are they? Uh, generator. Yeah. I mean, I don't, they, I think they may have, a, have gas inside, so they may have also propane, but in terms of the overall electricity for it. Generator. You know, you know who, uh, absolutely loves, uh, mobile kitchens, Nastasia. <laughs> well, you remember our Airstream, Mark and my Airstream. I sure disaster. don't. Um, you don't remember that? No. Oh, geez. I'm not getting into it. It's bad. That's like a hell, hell on, hell on hell wheels on is wheels. how you describe yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, what did you, like, what did you hate more? Like dealing with the, like the packing everything in the commissary aspect or the people that would approach you at the, at the Airstream? I think just Mark. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, like the 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 ultimate uh, the ultimate on air thing was when uh, uh, Eric Wareheim was on, Jeez. and we were talking about the Chef's Kiss. Oh, God. And the stuff you go, what'd you say, Stas? Well, they were like Chef's Kiss, Chef's Kiss, and I was like, y'all, these men talking about it, and I was like, first of all, none of you know what a Chef's Kiss tastes like, and I do, and it tastes like alcohol and sadness wow. and cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, and oh, cigarettes. Yeah. Man. Wow. Yeah. And we were just like, Whew. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay then. All right. Uh, I keep my mouth shut. First <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, what's in the business stays in the business. Uh, all right. What about you? What about you? Uh, what about you, Jack? What about you, Quinn? Any good food experiences? Nothing good, but I will have uh, some stuff to report next week because I'm going backpacking and I have a bunch of uh, freeze dried foods. I'll do a little taste test and report back if any of it's actually good. Are you bringing any Mountain House brand? What brands of freeze dried foods are you using? Oh, they're in my trunk, so I'd have to report back on. I, I, but I got like Wait. four different brands. And I'm going to do, do a little taste test. So you're going to do a taste test, but you don't know in advance which brands you have. 
mean, I do. They're just in my trunk. I don't have them in front of me right now. That sounds like a new segment, reporting back from <laughs> Jack's trunk. Yeah. Well, maybe it'll go better. Maybe it'll go better than when we had Nastasia's sister try to do the dump meals, and like she didn't like my tone of voice, and so she only did it once. Remember that, Stas? And she hung up on you, rightly so. I don't remember that. What do you mean, rightly so? <laughs> You were like so. ragging on her, and she was just like, "That's the I'm whole done. point of discussing this yeah. stuff." Come on, man. Please. I don't think those are two words that should be used next to each other. Me either, and yet those what? books sell millions of copies. Oh, is that meals. a thing? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, dump meals. I forget the lady's name who writes them. She has like a. It's like the Hardy Boys mysteries, but dump meals. There's like a million of them, or Nancy Drew, or whatever. The Boxcar <laughs> Kids. Ooh, Choose your have series. To learn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think you have to learn that, Taraja. Cool. I think that think you're all right without the. Are you a slow cooker kind of a person or no? Or do you do ever do that? Have you ever done that in your life? Been like, I'm gonna throw all this stuff in and then walk away, and when I go home, it'll be done. Do you do that? Some people, a lot of people do that. I don't do that. No. When you look up dump meal, she doesn't even come up. It's no man. Like, it's people it's have ripped her off. Easiest ever dump dinners on Food Network or our oh, best dump dinners God. for the cross pods. Right. Fifty slow cooker horrible. dump dinners. Yeah, yeah. it very it very much smacks of uh, the old farm to toilet idea for uh, <laughs> Mofad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the exhibit, people. Farm to toilet. Why only go to the table? It's only halfway there. Anyway. Oh, there's one. Hold on, very quickly. This woman, Kathy Mitchell, who I guess does that's it. These that's recipes. it. That's her. Yeah. There's there's a second book called Dump Cake. <laughs> yeah, Dump Cake. <laughs> All chocolate. And the you dump put cakes. a candle in it. Yeah. <laughs> Molten chocolate dump cake. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> so let's get uh, let's get right down to it. So you're on the show today uh, because you just came out with a book, and it is it, it's very hard to describe. It's a very unusual book. So let's just let's just start with it kind of how you started with some like a couple of months before the pandemic in late 2018. So no one knows what's going to happen. Right. You get a telephone call to get interviewed for potentially having a book job. I right? think you've skipped a year. Wasn't it 2018? When you got yeah, called? no, that's when yeah. I got called. But the pandemic started in 19, right? Uh, or was it 20? 20. Oh, 20. Yeah. I get my years confused. Yeah. Oh, uh, so yeah, it's a year yeah. before the pandemic. Uh, yeah, it's a year before the pandemic. Uh, thought, so, so gonna... yeah, uh, I was approached via my agent, my literary agent, about the fact that Fatima Ali wanted to write a book, and I was familiar with her via her Bon Appetit essays. She published two at that time, and I said I would adore to be considered, and you know, submitted some sam- writing samples. And long story short, um, I wound up. She wound up hiring me. And at that point, the plan, as I understood it, was that she wanted to travel and 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 really experience um, the restaurants of her dreams in the time that she had left. And, um, right, because she had been diagnosed... With terminal cancer. Right, but, less than a year earlier, right? And then... In, in I mean, September, October, right, right. before she, yeah. she wanted to announce that she wanted to write a book and started to look for um, a collaborator. And so she thought she had a year. And so... Um, that was the premise that we all kind of were embracing and excited about. And then it was just impossible. She was too unwell to travel and to um, eat like that and to to be on a plane. And so um, instead, I spent one week at her bedside uh, in Los Angeles and interviewed her and recorded everything and talked to her about the book she would have liked to write. And... Um, and her hopes and dreams and experiences in her past and um, and the lion's share of savor um, is from that, that week together. Um, and then interviews done with her mom and her brother and her friends um, and other family members after she passed. Right. Now, there was a, there was a, a small period before, because you flew out to L.A. in like January, mm-hmm. right? And you'd done your, your interviews like a couple like a couple of months before that. You realize that there's at maximum only like a year, right? Or a month before that. Did you feel like maybe this wasn't going to be happening? Did you know what was going on? No, or was I did all my interviews in that one week. Right, right. But I mean, like, in other words, there was a pause. I mean, like, if someone tells me I have a year left to live and we had to write a book, no. you didn't fly out immediately. There was still like a... Oh, yeah. I was waiting to know what we were, where we were going to meet in New York, where we were going to meet in... Copenhagen, where were we going to meet? I didn't know. I was waiting to kind of hear what the next step was going to be. And then 
it turned out the next step was to meet her in Los Angeles. And and it was very clear to me when I arrived there um, that she was not going to live for very much longer. And, um, and in fact, she passed two weeks later after our week together. Yeah, so... Yeah. So I mean so you signed on for this one project. She signed on. Well, she wanted to do this one project. Yeah. It very quickly became something else because, you know, she realized she wasn't gonna make it that long and that even if she made it a while longer, she was too sick to go anywhere. So what was I mean, let's just why don't we talk a little bit about her, talk a little bit about her life so people who don't know who she is yeah. get get a, a feeling for it. Or or if you want, you can just read it you wanna read an excerpt from the book. We've never done it before on the air. Would be good. Uh, sure, but it will take me a second to pull it up. So, All right, so while so you're pulling me, it up, I'll, ask you, uh, I'll yeah. ask you a question. So I wanted to say something. So she is, um, you know, was 20, 28, I guess, when she was diagnosed, 29 when she died. Uh, she was uh, Pakistani, uh, and uh, uh, she was a queer Pakistani woman who wanted to be a chef who's who was becoming very, very successful, was uh, on Chopped, was, uh, you know, a very, you know, well-loved, regarded, and did well on um, on uh, Top Chef, and, you know, had worked in, you know, very fine restaurants, was all excited to open her own restaurant. Her dream was to, you know, do two things, I think, bring, or three things, bring, you know, uh, higher-end, good Pakistani food to America, and also to... Uh, go to, to Pakistan and elevate the position of women and chefs in general in Pakistan and to, you know, do something to feed the hungry mouse that she was used to seeing when she was a child in, um, I guess it was Lahore or Karachi. What, what, it was what, both, what, yeah. yeah. And so she had all these goals mm -hmm. and she was well on her way to achieving those goals, um, you know, through a lot of obstacles, which are, you know, well documented in the book. And then, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, she she was deeply ambitious and incredibly gifted and um, very charismatic. And, um, you know, in the extremely short time that I physically spent with her, I, I found her, uh, you know, just magnetic. And I, I understood why she had such a, a massive following very quickly. And then, of course, the lessons that she's left behind via the book are, are lessons we, that apply to absolutely everyone no matter their race or their profession or their sexual identity. And she's, she's really saying, get busy living, enjoy, dig your teeth in, you know? Um, and, and, uh, yeah, she, I, I learned so much from her. She's made me live in a different way. So this is, um, an early chapter in the book from her childhood. <clears throat> it's called hunger at the market. We often accompanied our mother to the market to go grocery shopping, which I already understood as the first phase of every meal. We sat in the back of our rickety dinged secondhand white Suzuki Kyber and drove to Kata Market with my mother playing Stevie Nicks tape, singing along loudly to the edge of 17. As soon as we pulled up to, the, to park, I had... I heard a sharp rap on the window and my head snapped up. Large brown eyes, the same size as mine or Moe's, but seeming larger because of the sunken cheeks beneath them, appeared framed in our windows, a million miles between two centimeters of polished glass. The children put their hands out for money and then motioned to their mouths, the universal sign of hunger. Hello, hello, my mother greeted them good-naturedly as she and Muhammad pulled my seven-year-old self out of the backseat of the car. How many of you are there? Well, us two and our cousin, a child said sheepishly. Go round them up, my mother said. And off they ran, disappearing into the jigsaw of parked cars and crowds and child-sized crevices between overflowing shops. Sometimes they whistled to get each other's attention from afar, and suddenly there were eight, twelve, fourteen little and not-so-little people around us, shabbily dressed, hair uncombed, faces unwashed and thin. My mother looked around for the closest daba, a simple little local eatery serving big vats of food where cabbies and market purveyors all buy cheap, good meals. We've got 14 kids, my mother told the proprietor. What are you going to give them and what is it going to cost? The proprietor made up big plates of dal, curries, and fresh naan for the kids, one plate for each, and named a price for my mom, usually around 30 or 50 rupees, which included Cokes for everyone. She paid and waited for all the children to be served their food while my brother and I watched the little kids our age laughing, poking each other in the ribs, playful and relaxed for a moment now that they knew their next meal was coming soon and that it was going to be a fresh one, not foraged from a trash heap. I watched as this band of beggars' mouths watered and instead of getting hungry myself, my small throat went dry. 
Certainly, I was not immune to the seductive sense of Pakistani comfort food being readied for consumption. My mouth watered as I smelled fluffy biryani warming on the stovetop or chamois kebabs for dinner at home. But seeing these hollow-cheeked kids so giddy and ravenous, I realized I'd never really, I'd never truly known hunger. Though I knew that money was hard earned, not only my mother, not only could my mother always feed us, she had enough to feed the small army of street kids. 50 rupees is all it took, and every Sunday we were 50 rupees later, and those little boys and girls had full bellies for once. Not knowing how or when, but I made a promise to myself that I would feed people. So that is relatively early in the book, but it comes back again and again. You know, it, like, it's very clear that at the end of her life, she's really re- reflecting on that particular goal, even more than becoming successful, which was clearly a huge goal. Uh, you know, of her life. So how clear, I know that there was a foundation was started. How, like, how clear was she to you in the time you had that she wanted this book to help with kind of that goal and the goal of allowing other people like her to see that this is possible to do? I think she was very clear about her goals. I mean, that was a lot of what we discussed was what did she want this book to be and what would she be doing if she didn't have to focus her goals in a book and could just be doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what she realized is that her story through the book um, could inspire other young Pakistani women to realize that there were, there was a world, that the world was their oyster, that they could you know, go off and and discover new careers and have adventures that perhaps had not originally occurred to them or that they'd felt somehow were off limits to them. I think that was a tremendous goal of hers, the inspiration of other uh, young Pakistani, in particular, girls. Um, In terms of feeding people, uh, I think that the Chef Fatima Foundation is an incredible step in that direction. I think it really broke her heart that that was not something she figured out how to do in her lifetime to the degree that she wanted to do it. I mean, this is an incredibly ambitious person who believed that, you know, if she became uh, a world-renowned chef, she would be able to really make a dent in the um, hunger crisis in her country um, using her, her celebrity as a tool to help that. So I think that was a hard thing, a hard goal for her to let go of. And I think the end of her life was a series of um, recalibrations of goals. And that was extremely hard for her and her family and everyone who loved her. Right. So that now I don't know, kind of know where to, where to go into this. Cause there's kind of two things. One's the structure of the book. So at the end of the book, uh, towards the end of the book, when, you know, you fly out to the hospital, <clears throat> there's a, a scene where you're at the foot of the bed and these doctors come in and some doctor wisecracks, there's going to be a book by a lot of people. And she's like, no, you know what I mean? She doesn't want it to feel like just a, mm-hmm. a like a pastiche of things from mm-hmm. different people. And yet the actual structure of the book is in fact, it's not a dialogue, mm-hmm. but it it is, a, I mean, it is, it is a back and forth between two perspectives, Fatima's perspective, perspective, and her mother's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm kind of wondering how that worked. There's also like very, I mean, there's stuff that, you know, she brought up in the in what she was talking about with you or the notes and writing that she gave you that I can't imagine writing about, you know, my family if I wasn't like right at a place where n- none of that mattered anymore. You know what I mean? She's really pulling out like a lot of the stops. And her mom also, this is an interesting part of the book, at the very beginning of the book is like, this book's going to be hard. And there's this kind of amazing discussion between Fatima and the mother about, is it okay to do this book? Because you're going to have to deal with it when I'm dead and it's going to be unpleasant. So, I mean, w- one, like how did that work? afterwards and two like what did she, i know she was a writer right so did she i know the parts of her bon appetit uh writing are woven into the later sections of the book but like and i know she was writing at the end uh you know feverishly and probably recording as well so like what i mean i'm sure when you were there for the week you were just trying to absorb as much of her personalities as humanly possible but then what did you physically have to work with like how how does that work when so it's so unusual of process um, well, 
Uh, in terms of weaving into the narrative what had already been written, uh, certainly the published essays that she had written before for Bon Appetit and for a couple other publications um, earlier, in long before she knew that she had cancer or had cancer, um, things that she wrote when she was more of a student and um, and right after winning CHOP, so in her early, very early 20s. Um, so I, I tried to weave all of anything that was originally, you know, that she'd written as much intact without as any edits as much as possible. Um, in terms of what she was working on at the end of her life, uh, there was there were some really beautiful pieces. Um, it wasn't um, a tremendous amount. Uh, the lion's share of the book is from our conversations, which were almost like dictation in a way because she was so articulate and so um, descriptive when she was talking about something she was passionate about, which obviously we were trying to do a lot of. Um, so it was very complicated. And then the addition of, uh, her mother as a voice came from the fact that we had such a brief time together and, uh, there was concern that there wouldn't be enough only in Fatima's voice. And so it made sense to all of us that her mother, who, from whom, you know, Fatima sprang and, and, um, was very inspired by and guided by, um, and another strong Pakistani woman should be also a perspective in this. And uh, I mean, I'm very personally interested in mother-daughter stories. So um, this was clear to me that this is how the story should be told. Um, and and then, yeah, that's pretty much how that happened. So uh, the parts that are from her mom's perspective are from after Fatima passed from our interviews and then her mother um, also working on those herself. That had to be incredibly difficult for everybody. It was incredibly difficult, incredibly painful. It took a tremendous amount of bravery bravery on the part of her family. And um I, you know, I don't I don't think there was anything easy about it. But we all sort of made this promise. I mean, it's different for me. I was relatively a stranger, but I, I still took it quite seriously, my promise to her to try to make something of this. And it was very clear to me once I understood, uh, once she shared with me more about her story, that this wasn't just some Food Network, you know, popular chef. She didn't want to tell a sort of behind the scenes tell all of being on, on a cooking show. Um it was this was a much deeper and wider story um, that touches on universal issues of love, family, uh, identity. Yeah, and also like mortality. You know, even at her age, she already kind of realized she's like in the book, right? You know, one of the one of the things that is her desire to constantly be the best and succeed is most of the time driving her in the right direction until she feels it doesn't anymore. And then it like happens like a, like a bunch, not a bunch, but several big times where she's like, well, I, I quit my, I quit my job because it was too easy. It wasn't taking me in the right direction. It's like she wanted fame, but not necessarily, she wanted fame, I think for fame's sake, but also to do all these amazing things. So she must've been just a really interesting personality to, to deal with even for that one week. But I, like, I wonder what was it? She was in intense pain the entire time that you were with her. Was it, did it make it difficult for her to tell the stories to, through the filter of all of that pain? She was on a, she was on some like a experimental pain lidocaine drip that, you know, was uh, dreamed up by her doctors at uh, yeah, St. Kettering. It you was know. something that didn't seem like it should work to help with her pain. And yet it did. Um, <clears throat> from what I understand. Yeah. I mean, it was a very um, meditative, slow conversation that um, had in the background of it, you know, the sound of being in a hospital, the sort of mechanical sounds of um, whirring and beeping and machines that are telling you what's going on with the patient's body. And, it was very, it was very slow com conversing, although we covered it a lot. Um, and it was deeply move moving and emotional. Uh, I think f for all of us, I can speak for myself and, and observing some of the conversations between Fatima and her brother, who was always present whenever she and I were speaking, um, was incredibly moving, their love for each other and devotion to each other. Yeah, the the other thing that's really interesting when you read it that's very apparent. So, you know, normally when 
someone's writing a book that's coming out in their own first person and they have the chance to kind of finish it themselves, right? The, the experience of the information that they're, that they're um, putting together in their head and putting out has a chance to like change and morph over time, right? But here, like, you know, you spend years working on the information that was gathered from a synthesis at this one intense crisis point in her life. And I think it really imbues the point of view she has with uh, <clears throat> a kind of like crystallinity of purpose that would be impossible to get in a situation where the the person whose thoughts are going on, on, on you know, on the paper has a year or two to think about it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Totally. And I think that the people who were left to do that thinking were her mom and her brother. And and that was immensely difficult for them. Um, and there was a tension between all of us, you know, saying, of course, we'll figure out how to make this book for you. And then the reality of the messages that she wanted to leave behind and some of which were were hard truths. And, um, you know, in my introduction, I, I say that my marching orders came on our last day together. She said, you're going to figure out how to do this. I know you can do it. And I thought, well, if she knows I can do it, then I suppose I can do it. But, you know, she was, she really gave me instructions and I tried to be very true to them and take them very seriously. So, uh, Another interesting thing about the, the mother perspective and, you know, Fatima's perspective is that they are sometimes, at odds is the wrong term, but they definitely have different current, well, current as of the writing of the book, right? You have whatever the theoretical present tense is in a situation when somebody's gone. But they have different current views of the same things that are being presented side by side, chapter by chapter. I mean, you know, and it's, uh, and it's interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a presentation quite like that. So was it difficult to kind of go between the two voices? Cause they are quite different. They're quite different. Yeah. Um, as I said, Faraze, Fatima's mother, um, very much, uh, went over everything in her voice to make sure it, she felt it was, absolutely in her own voice. Um, I would say that uh, Fatima and I had a lot more uh, sort of common ground in the way we talked about things, probably because we were passionate about some of the same things in terms of food. And there's a commonality to talking about kitchens and, and cooking school that we experiences we both have had. So I think that was like a creative shorthand to some extent. But Do you, do um, you share her disdain for tattooed chefs from Brooklyn? Um, <laughs> let me think about that. I want to answer honestly. No, I don't have to stay yeah, 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 for no, it. Okay. But, but she, <laughs> no, she, she clearly, but, but you know, no. she's like, yeah, yeah, but it is she a was bit, sick of the trope. She was sick but of the it's trope. It's a trope, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I think I thought that was funny um, and and great. And um, so your original question, uh, the very the distinct voices. Um, well, I think that I found found that to be a really interesting way to talk about. Facts. A, because we all have our own experiences of a situation. Two people can sit in a room and watch a movie and they might have totally different experiences of what they just watched. And I think especially for a mother or daughter, um, when there's a generational gap and uh, also, you know, an experiential gap, um, seeing things through both of their perspectives is really interesting. And I, and I hope that it's something that mothers and daughters will take away from this is thinking, well, it might feel different to to the other side. Right. And the other, uh, the other main, one of the other main frictions going through the book is that, you know, um, Fatima clearly has a love for Pakistan, Pakistani culture, food, and a desire to like um, bring, like, you know, have it not just be a place that Americans think of as like land, of, land of terror and poverty, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. You know, to paraphrase, yeah. you know what she has, what she said. At the other time, she's extraordinarily conflicted about what America is like. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing because she always found. Well, she she told you, I guess, how, how difficult she found it to be 
things that she wasn't really supposed to be in, in Pakistan, right? You weren't, a woman wasn't supposed to be a professional chef. Uh, a woman was supposed to marry a, a nice Pakistani man, which she clearly says like five or eight times that she doesn't want to do. She, you know, is definitely not supposed to be queer, which she is. Like none of that's okay. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, in a lot of what she wants, she has the kind of, like intense support from her mom, who also made some non-traditional decisions in her Absolutely, life in yeah. terms of divorce, which wasn't okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and moving moving about uh, in you know ways that weren't necessarily okay uh, for and, and being yeah fiercely independent, right? Yeah. For you know a, a woman because she's a relatively you know they didn't have a lot of money because of the decisions she made at some points That's in right. their lives, but she was still you know uh, uh, you know from a uh, upper echelons of Pakistani society. So how clear was she on that kind of friction of not being necessary, like wanting to kind of fix things that were wrong in both places when you were talking to her? In terms of America and Pakistan? I mean, as as we touched on before, I think she really wanted to help with the poverty crisis and the hunger crisis. Um, And I think here she wanted, as you said, people to think of other things, uh, you know, other than terror and fear. when they thought of Pakistan and her her approach to that was absolutely beautiful, which was she wanted to just disarm people through their taste buds and she wanted to uh, introduce them to a place of beauty and care and hospitality through our through hospitality itself by opening a restaurant she she likened what she wanted to do here in New York or America to an uncle Boone's where you walk in and you're sort of um, of your senses, the music, the the posters, the food, the scents are all taking you on this journey. And in the case of Pakistan, it would be one that most people are totally unfamiliar with. Um, and so I think, I don't, I can't say how much she wanted to change about America. I think she was very clear eyed about it not being a perfect place. And we definitely didn't want um, it to appear that there was a a trope in the book of America being the sort of open-minded savior land, because that's ridiculous, especially in this current atmosphere. But, um, but uh, she did feel a a freedom and a expansive sort of, I think, anonymity that she could accomplish more here. Yeah. Well, she gained quite a bit of, um, like back when she went back home after she was on TV and started getting press, then she seemed to be more accepted for what she was doing afterwards, right? So that seemed that seemed to be kind of a positive note, no? Oh, I think she was always accepted and um, adored for her work there. Um, but I think um, she was ex- she she became extremely well known based on what my understanding in Pakistan, uh, and so people would sort of come up to her on the street even more than they might hear. In America, did you ever get to go over or no? I didn't because um, of the pandemic. Right. So I was supposed to go in uh, March 2020, and that was right after lockdown began. Um, and then I was going to try to go the following year, but I was expecting a baby, so it wasn't yeah. the time to to do that kind of travel. Yeah. No, maybe someday. I hope so. I've never been to the, anywhere in that region of the earth. I've been to India, but I expect Pakistan to be a completely different experience. I was supposed to go to Delhi in the pandemic. I was supposed to like be able to go to Delhi in the pandemic, whatever. It's a minor, minor inconvenience in life. So I'll make it hopefully someday. I've yes. got another couple of years, hopefully you never know though. That's like the thing of the book. I mean, the, the cancer that she got was so intensely aggressive. Here is an incredibly healthy 28 year old woman comes, does top chef, does a, a, a is, does a, wins some sort of in like stage of her choice, basically. Mm-hmm goes uh, to uh, hang out with uh, Chris Costow, mm-hmm. right? Who apparently, like, you know, she does a great job there. Like, everybody, you know, going on all cylinders is going to do uh, some opening uh, out here. Uh, I forget what it was, some pop-up opening out here while she's, you know, waiting to figure out her next move. Her social media is going through the freaking roof because Top Chef is starting to air, right? And, like, everything is is going great. She has this great network of people that she met on Top Chef plus her New York City cooking network. You know, she also has people, you know, her mom's like, we'll get you a place in Pakistan. You can, you can, you have the pick of your place to, to cook in Lahore if you want to come mm-hmm. back here. All this amazing stuff. And then, bang, 
Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a great, I mean, obviously intensely sad, uh, but you know, just the section of it kind of like portrait of a, of a young chef is kind of, is an interesting. Well, it's really most, the book is really about living. Yeah. I mean, and everyone kind of looks at me like I'm crazy when I say that, but it is the bulk of this book is about really living right? and really, um, sinking your teeth in and, um, and not waiting and not making excuses to do the things that you long to do. Um, because of course we don't know what is coming around the bend. Yeah. She also, I mean, um, she does a lot of forgiving at the end. Mm -hmm. Like, were you present for that stuff or did you hear about it afterwards or? It was sort of happening. A lot of it, um, was happening one, not when I was in the room, but in that week that I was there. And so I was getting, uh, some really incredible breathless accounts of the, uh, conversations she had had just before I'd been with her right after I'd left the night before, um, with her very close family members. So, uh, yeah, our last day together was extremely powerful. She was having, uh, visions and, um, and she was, she was, she seemed past pain. She was very, um, punchy and, and kind of excitable in a really beautiful way. And, um, it it was, it was the entire experience of being around that much, love, although it was extremely painful, was awe-inspiring. Right. And you, I believe, were there for the conversation when the doctors were going to do a bunch of stuff. She's like, forget it. Yes. That's got to be a, that's got to be a a very intense thing to be the, I mean, you were, you were there as a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. You just met her. A few days before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah, it was. There were, the doctors all came in the, around in this pack and um, it was probably a teaching hospital or something. So they were always followed by s- students. Um, yeah, she was at uh, whatever that, what's the LA place, right? Stas? UCLA Medical Center. UCLA, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and as she was saying, like, no, I don't want another MRI. Like, no. And then the, the doctors were, you could, I was watching everything that was happening and they were, you know, trying not to cry, but tears were rolling down their cheeks because she was so brave and she was sort of coaching everyone around her on being strong and, um, and you know, instead of people holding her up, she was holding them up. And it was an yeah. astonishing thing to witness. I mean, that, that basically comes through. She's like, Doc, it's, please, enough, that's fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, I'm just doing my job. And yeah. she says, you know, I know and you've done it and I'm going to be okay. I'm like, but you got to let me go. Yeah, she's like, you know, it's like a, the end the end of the book. Yeah, so it, it's living for like 240-something pages, and then the end of it is, you know, uh, I think, you know, kind of a, a good, a, as good an ending as someone can hope uh, to have in the terrible kind of situation. In other words, what she did with it, not her physical pain was obviously a horrific nightmare, but what the way she chose to deal with it, I thought was... Well, yeah, I mean, she's leaving this incredible legacy and message for the rest of us to, to get smart. And going back to what I said about like a very cr- like crystal like vision of a particular point in in somebody's life, what an indictment of the American medical system. Oh my gosh. What that family went through. Like, I don't think, I mean, nothing that I read seems like it could have changed the outcome, but just what a horrific, horrific experience. We misfiled the insurance papers, so yeah. you can't get the biopsy that you need. That's you know right. what I mean? And like, just like back and forth. And then when she moves from New York to LA, the insurance has to change because she's not in New York anymore. And they, it, you know, what a just what a crap show! Like, what just a horrible nightmare. And you know, John, I'm sure you're privy to all of this stuff too. Just what a horrible nightmare ha- yeah. having something like this happens to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, so if you want to know, you know, I thought it was a very good representation of what a intense, intense pile of crap navigating that system can be in the absolute worst time of your life. I mean, there are some medical heroes, like the guy from, from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Wexler mm-hmm, comes, mm-hmm. apparently the family loves him, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And he comes across as a good, as a good guy, 
but just like a bunch yeah. of a bunch of people like saying offhand things. Oh, it's it's it nothing. Shocking. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Put some ice on it. You know what I mean? Oh, your you know your your hip is broken or whatever. You know all this like nutty stuff because they they can't get the the approvals to do these kind of clear procedures that are indicated, and then at the end over procedureing. It's just like a yeah. And we're not talking about you know a, there was no language barrier. Everyone in her family speaks English beautifully, perfectly. Um, it's not like there was there were miscommunications. It's not like they weren't advocating for her. They were advocating and then some, um, you know, writing everything down, sharing everything that they could with the doctors. And mm. and still, there mm. was, yeah. Nightmare. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, whatever. I mean, look, my, my family, family of, of uh, doctors, we all know it's, we, I mean, you know, my, the family is doctors. It's a complete nightmare and not necessarily for any good reason. Um, so that's another reason to uh, check out the book. Stas, you got any, uh, you got any questions? No, I, I, no. Good job, Dave. What? You uh, read the whole book. I always read <laughs> people. If you're going to be on the show, I will read the work. That's like the least. I know that most people don't, but that's the least you can do, right? Someone wrote the book. You're having them on. No, but a lot of people like it's been getting great reviews. So everyone should buy it. Um, but uh, yeah, you got reviewed in the times. I we did. Yeah. I was flabbergasted. Never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be reviewed in the New York Times <laughs> book review. And then it was the most thoughtful review. So I, I'm just, I'm so grateful that that happened to this book. So what's it like when you're writing and you literally write on the page of yourself, the impression she has of you in the hospital as the hired witness to what's going on. I mean, that, that's got to be surreal. Well, um, you know, the book has changed, of course, as all as all books do in it, the process of it coming to the world. And um, at one point, uh, you know, I was more of a character. And so I was thinking about, uh, in that section in particular, I was thinking, I was seeing, I was recording. I was also journaling a ton <laughs> while this was happening because it was so much to take on and to kind of sort through. Um, and so uh, that was probably something that, I felt at that time, I felt like a hired witness. I felt my job was to be there listening, taking it all in and then figure out how to kind of organize it. I mean, that was my job actually. So Right, right. But also like the character of you is portrayed not as an interloper because you're definitely wanted to be there, but definitely like the pale face in the room of, of, of brown people. Mm-hmm. Literally, I believe that's paraphrasing what mm-hmm. is written in the book. Mm-hmm. And especially when the doctors come in, you know what I mean? Because it's all part of that same that that same uh, section. And it's just got to be. I mean, I'm sure you had to have felt like you were doing something that is very much what she wanted was her desire, but also that you're kind of injecting yourself, not of your own volition, right? But you're injecting yourself into this incredibly private, intense situation. That's got to be one of the weirdest weeks ever. It was. And in my introduction, I talk about how nervous I was to take up her time when there was clearly very limited time left and to take her away from the people who loved her the most, who wanted to soak up every instant with her. Um, And her brother assured me before I went into her room for the first time that this was what Fatima wanted. And I think, and then her mother said to me that, you know, my presence and our working together toward this goal of Fatima's book um, was giving her purpose. And actually that purpose was, was somehow, I can't possibly say if it was making things easier for her, but it, it did lend a, 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 a real purposefulness to those days that we spent together because we were trying so hard to get as much done as possible together. Right. I mean, well, the mom says that nothing can make it easier. I mean, the mom's intro at the beginning is like, don't bother comforting me. Don't bother, you know, that there is no comfort. To that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there is no more unimaginable pain than the loss of a child. And I, I, I think we all... Um, our, I think grief evolves. I've lost someone very dear to me, uh, and it, 
he was not my child, so I don't know what it is like to lose a child. But um, I don't know that that ever goes away. It might change forms a little bit, but that is that is the worst thing that anyone can imagine, I think, losing a baby. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine that and also... But I guess the, in the intro, along with her saying, don't basically don't bother trying to give me words of comfort because there are none, she's also like... I don't have anything left to lose, really. So this is the book with all of the stuff, whether I want you to know it or not, here yeah, it is. She really, um, she wants to embrace Fatima's uh, approach to living, I think, uh, and be guided by that. And she wants that for others, I think. Yeah. Um, well, the book is called uh, Savor. What's the... What's the slug line underneath? A chef's hunger for more. A chef's hunger for more. Yeah. Uh, uh, Fatima Ali and Taraj Morel, you should uh, pick it up. And then in the few minutes we have left, uh, you want to answer some crazy questions, Taraj? In the few related to the book or unrelated? No, 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 unrelated. Totally want to answer some crazy unrelated questions. Yeah. I mean, like, we'll just answer them all together. This okay. is how it works. Anyone that has an opinion on what people ask us. Okay. So the, the normal thing oh, with this I show see, is I people see, right. ask us normal they ask us abnormal questions typically right. yeah and then we have to have answers because we have issues cooking issues uh you know and i think again while the book is by no means a cookbook or even a food book it is a chef's memoir and so you know i think is germane to the cooking issues don't you think oh 100 percent. yeah absolutely it made me wish i knew more about pakistani food by the way well i wish i knew more too but what i do know is that it's so delicious all i'm saying is i want that so that in one of the scenes by the way uh, i know i'm supposed to answer questions one of the scenes in the book is um so they this is after she uh quits her job with whatever the restaurant group is that owns Centro and those things, right? She goes back to uh to Pakistan and and it's like wedding season there and like you know high society friends, bunch of cool weddings. And so like her her mom's best friend who's basically her aunt, right? And the the dad who's now dead I think as well of the aunt, right? The husband, I think he died. Anyway, Fatima loves him and her hires this this amazing grill expert from like the north of like the very north of Pakistan and basically only hires this this dude and his whole crew to come in for weddings and pump out this this like amazing like on point not very spicy but just on point um, grilled lamb stuff mm -hmm. and the one that she describes and and there's kind of a cool scene where the mom this is from the mom's perspective the mom's like you know, no one is paying attention to these cooks and Fatima goes over and like really gives, you know, really gives respect to these cooks. And it's like the first time that any, anyone basically in her group has you know, acknowledged, other than the fact that the dad clearly thinks they're cool, otherwise they wouldn't keep hiring them to come back and do mm -hmm. weddings. But like it's the first time they've been acknowledged as kind of masters of their craft. And so they make a special plate. But then it's this thing which on its face doesn't sound like something I would like, but then when the more you read about it, you're like, I didn't need it, where they take this like young lamb's liver and salt and pepper, and then they wrap it in like a very thin veil of lamb belly fat and then quick grill it on a skewer. The, I love uh, how carefully you read this. Yeah. It's so heartening. And uh, anyway, so now I want to try that, but I don't know I can get that. You can't get that in the city, right? Well, uh I'm not, I'm, you probably can somewhere. What I learned also from this experience is that um, there's a beautiful network um, of, of people who make Pakistani food, which is laborious and often is best made in large quantities. And they, they're not professionals. They're sort of home cooks, but then they all kind of, they could sell you a whole setup of, of, you know, dinner um, instead of you're having to make it all at home yourself. Mm. If you know who to call. You if could... you know who to call. That's right. I'll work on that. Yeah, that's cool. You know, yeah. that's like a, a thing that, uh, you know, when Pierre Chom was on, he was saying that when he first came to the U.S., like a lot of the good uh, Senegalese cooking in New York was kind of similar where it wasn't restaurants where you, it, it wasn't your house either. No. It was like this kind of third, yeah. this kind of third thing, which yeah. I find fascinating. Uh, all right, Jim, uh, 
So Jim asked a long time ago, I just need help from the Discord. Jim wants to know if there's any combination salts that incorporate, uh, you know, NaCl, sodium chloride, with MSG and disodium, uh, inus, uh, whatever, the, the nucleic acid. I can never pronounce it, so I won't do it. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, man. And guanolate as enhancers. If not, any suggestions on the relative proportions of each for ready-to-sprinkle umami salt? Someone from Discord, help me, because I don't do that. I don't I haven't tested it. Um, Andrew uh, Zimmer. Uh, some... Go for it, Quinn. Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say that, like, certain brands of, like, stock powders do contain MSG and the nucleic acids. Now, you know what else does? Uh, fermented Taiwanese uh, chili, like, the, the is it, like, 20% salt? It's like it's like it's like eighty percent chili, twenty percent salt, and or like fifteen percent salt, and then MSG and other stuff. And I add that to a- absolutely everything. And and my wife Jen is like, by the way, the reason I don't have the book with me today, and I had to do this all from memory, and I had to make you read off your phone, is because my wife picked the book. She's like, finally a book that I want to read because huh. I I don't read about people. I read about things typically. So she's like, this is not the normal book that gets mailed to you, Dave. I'm gonna read this one. So she's reading. She's like halfway through. Anyway. Okay. Uh, Wismerd writes in, Dave, how's the book going? Give us a progress report on the miracle of moisture management. Oh, wait, hold up, Dave. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Andrew Zimmern did a post on MSG salt combination. I think he did two to one MSG to salt. That's a lot of MSG, though. Yeah. That's that's a little high to me. That's a little high. Uh, uh, I, I really prefer to do the salt and MSG separate. If you do have... If you do buy the combo of like the savory nucleic acids, I've heard a good ratio is like ninety seven percent MSG and then three percent of those other uh nucleic acids. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get one of those really ridiculous like you know those tuxedo, those weird tuxedo coats that are like this high, that are like up like near your chest, and then the super tight cummerbund that look incredibly preposterous that the three star Michelin uh, French dudes used to wear. Remember these, uh, John? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna wear that. I'm gonna just walk into someone's restaurant, and then I'm gonna walk up to the table with a like like a, like a, a giant like coquille Saint Jacques shell <laughs> and and. And and a and a pearl spoon and a you know mother of pearl spoon and I'm just gonna walk up and be like, Madame savory nucleic acids, and start sprinkling on the thing and see whether this is not a good sounding thing to sprinkle on your food. Is it? Is it, John? What do you think? No, not really. Yeah, it's not very good. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you though, Quinn. Uh, Zach from Pittsburgh writes in, how's you doing? Are there any dairy-free ways to make Irish cream? I have a family member who has a new dairy allergy and is lamenting not having Baileys for both cooking and drinking. So listen, I looked at some of the vegan Baileys. Uh, uh, do you guys, I mean, did you, any guys like, are you guys Baileys people or Irish cream people? Anything? Uh, once or twice. Once or twice? In my uh, life. In, when you were young. Makes a good milkshake. Mm-hmm. Does make a good milkshake. So listen, the internet is uh, full of people who tell you to use coconut milk for that, but I wouldn't use coconut milk. Coconut milk, unless it's incredibly highly stabilized, tends to clump or curdle when it gets uh, when it gets very cold. That's the, fu- the function of the fat, of how coconut fat works. So I would actually use uh, almond milk probably or uh, some other kind of nut milk like that. If you do use coconut milk, I would use one that's like very highly stabilized, like maybe the condensed stuff that's been stabilized so it won't curdle. And I would use a little bit of ticaloid, which is a uh, xanthan and uh, gum arabic mix. And apparently, other than that, it's whiskey, espresso, sugar, uh, and vanilla. Hold it. Uh, Dave Kleiman, has anyone prepared shuck raw rice before it gets to dry while it's freshly picked and not starchy yet and treated it similarly to raw corn niblets cooking it? Is it feasible? Well... Well, Dave, when rice is harvested, it's usually harvested at about 20% moisture, so it's already pretty dry. In uh, Tanzania, there is something called uh, pepita, where they harvest the rice uh, green when it's still high moisture. They then roast it, pound it into... uh, pound it into flakes, and then winnow it after they pound it to get rid of the husks, and then they eat those pellets. But I ain't never tasted it. Uh... Steve wants to know, there's a bunch of Rotovaps, Steve Young, there's a bunch of Rotovaps uh, selling for under $2,000 and one for under $900 on Amazon. Do you think they look legit? Well, I mean, 
Look, I think you could probably get them to work, but are they going to be as good as the ones that cost a zillion dollars? No, but if you let me, and they have no reviews, I would not buy anything like that that has no reviews. Plus, also, the glass on those things is not plastic coated, so guard your eyes, my friend. Guard your eyes. Uh, Jack, I'm going to get to your carnitas, and I'm going to get to uh, John's, uh, Colton's uh, question on pie from Pie Marches On, which, by the way, John, he calls the pie Ah, he calls it the Bible, which I appreciate. We'll get to that next week. Taraja, thanks so much for coming on. Hope you had a good time. Thank you so much. Cooking Issues. Cooking Issues.